Hey everyone watching on Twitch and YouTube later, this is TJ. Uh, just a quick apology, I forgot to do a local recording for the first episode of the podcast. Um, and also, I since it's a new Twitch account, I did not have it set to automatically save broadcasts. So we don't actually have full video of this episode. Um, it's just going to be a splash screen with uh, audio. Uh, but in the future, you'll actually be able to see what we're looking at and you know what we're pointing at and what we're referencing on the, the Twitch archives and the YouTube version. So, sorry about that, and without further delay, on with the podcast. Hello and welcome to No CB, a grand strategy podcast where we talk mostly about the games developed by uh, Paradox Development Studio, your Crusader Kings, your Europa Universalis, your Stellaris, your Hearts of Iron, your Victoria. Uh, wherever, wherever there is strategy and history and sometimes giant alien space monsters intersecting will be there. Uh, I am your host, TJ Hafer. You may know me as Asa TJ. Uh, it's not Asa. A lot of people call me Asa when they meet me in person for the first time. It's Asa TJ. Uh, you may know me as the what the patch notes actually mean guy from Reddit. Uh, you might know me from Three Moves Ahead, PC Gamer. I did the Crusader Kings Chronicles. Um, all sorts of fun stuff. And I have uh, assembled a panel of community pillars and strategy experts here uh, that will be joining us on uh, this journey. Uh, Rose, you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. So I'm Enigmatic Rose. I stream here on Twitch and I stream over on YouTube. I put up videos over on YouTube. I never stream on YouTube. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> Some people, I guess. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know. I've heard it's a thing. <laughs> Uh, apparently it is. Um, I play a lot of Paradox games. Specifically, CK2 is probably my favorite. Sorry, EU4 fans. But I think that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we also have Lambert. You want to introduce yourself? Hey, so I'm Lambert. I mostly uh, upload videos to YouTube. Most of the time it's uh, Imperative Rome right now, but uh, I do play some EU4 Stellaris. All the good stuff, and uh, I also stream a bit on D Live. Yeah. And last but not least, we have Father Loris. Yeah. Hello, I'm Father Loris. I draw the Chapel Comics, there's CD Comics that sometimes pop up occasionally. Pollutes your Reddit streams and Twitter streams occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so the, we're going to be uh, the four main hosts. Uh, we also hope to have some guests on in the future. Some other community people, some developers, and uh, stuff like that. But since this is kind of our pilot episode, um, it's going to be a little bit of a different format than usual. We'll probably usually start with talking about dev diaries and stuff like that, um, and uh, then move into a main topic. But today our main topic is kind of more of a get-to-know-us show. Uh, so we're going to kind of talk about how we got into grand strategy, You know, our, our experience with the genre, what it means to us. So those of us, those of you who who don't know us or don't know us that well, uh, can kind of get acquainted. But before that, uh, we're gonna do a quick check in on Victoria Three at the top of the show. Uh, so far, um, I'm getting no Victoria Three has not been announced yet. Yes, I can confirm Victoria Three has not been announced yet. Uh, but I instructed everybody without <laughs> discussing it. Without going into any of their reasoning whatsoever, to come here with a prediction of an exact day uh, when Victoria 3 will be announced. Uh, Loris, let's put your prediction on the board first. When do you think Victoria 3 is going to be announced? So I was going to say 2025. Not out of any sort of logic, but okay. simply because I was going to hopefully <laughs> <laughs> just just slightly edge out one of the other people and then like <laughs> and then I would be closest. Do you have <laughs> a day? Like if you had to pick a day oh. when it, when when you want to okay. say Let's have a look. I'll say I'll say January 1st cuz January know. 1st. Okay. 2025 going on the Cause, board. Cuz that instantly beats anyone who says like at the end of 2024. <laughs> right. Yeah, what so. if I say the second of January, twenty twenty-five. Now, ah, oh, you can't. You've already well, written see, it down. <laughs> see, that's why. That's why I said don't discuss it beforehand, because then you get into like this whole strategic thing. Uh, Lambert, what was your guess? Um, so I think it's going to be announced at a ParadoxCon, but okay. I don't know when that's going to be. Good guess. Okay. So I instead just went with Victoria's birthday, which is the twentieth of June, and I'm going to say twenty twenty-one. 
2021. Okay. Rose, when do you think it's going to be announced? I guess I was being very um, optimistic here. I was thinking PDXCon next year in 2020, 10 years after Vicky 2. Okay. Which, All right. And just randomly picking a Saturday there, I put it October 17th. If they okay. do do PDXCon then. October 17th, 2020. My guess was actually very close to Lambert. I said August 7th, 2021, because it's a Saturday that is about halfway between when they used to have Paradox Con in May and when they had it this most recent year in October. So I decided to just kind of split the difference. Oh, mine's um, miles out now, man. Like, yeah, well, you might end up winning. I mean, you know, the last... The uh, last... If, it, if it goes past 2025, I'm, I'm sorted. <laughs> So, so uh, we've got Rose is October 17th, 2020. Uh, Lambert says June 20th, 2021. I said August 7th, 2021. And Laura says January 1st, 2025. Uh, we'll see who, who wins. Maybe there will be some sort of prize. Maybe it'll just be bragging rights. Uh, you can let us know uh, in the comments or whatever uh, what you think. Or maybe it'll never come out. No, you. Maybe you that's heresy. I, that's heresy. We won't well, allow that kind of talk on this podcast. I won't allow it. Well, see, technically, Loris wins if it never comes out because Infinity <laughs> is like marginally closer to his guess than to anyone else's. I, I do have to correct yeah. myself there. I misspoke. Twenty um, fifth June is when she was coronated as Queen of the UK and Great okay. Britain Island. Not her birthday. Fair enough. All but right. I'll take her birthday as well. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> multiple I, I can have two. That's okay. uh, I'll have the death of a universe too. Maybe. Then, if we're having two. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe that that'll cheating. be a Patreon tier if you want to subscribe and <laughs> uh, have an extra, extra guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, all right. Uh, by the way, everybody in chat, I am looking at chat um, because this is going to be a show that's going to be on Twitch and YouTube, as well as like SoundCloud, Stitcher. There will be a lot of people, you know, listening to it after the fact. Um, I'm not going to be re responding to chat a lot during the show, but we might have like a little um, segment at the end where I, I pull some of the best questions from throughout the stream. Um, but thanks for showing up. I am reading what you're saying. Um as we go along, it's just not going to be a super heavy chat interaction type of stream. Um, but anyway, the topic of the show today, how did you get into grand strategy? What does grand strategy mean to you? Uh, Lambert, do you want to start us off? Oh, okay then. Um, so uh, probably my starting would be back in 2014. Uh, I was playing quite a lot of Civ 4 and randomly I got a 50% off CK2 voucher in my Steam inventory, so I, I had no idea what CK2 was at that point. So I guess I probably came in quite late compared to most people. Um, but I went on to YouTube to figure out what this CK2 malarkey was all about, and I found Northern Lion's Britannia campaign, and from oh, yeah. there he went and did the multiplayer with Arumba and Mathis, and that's where I found EU4, and s several thousand hours later playing... Grand strategy <laughs> games, and I'm, I'm here. Uh, so. Fantastic. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, All right. What it means to me, I well, I mean, I've got a, a YouTube channel now where I post a lot of videos of grand strategy games and go over dev diaries, and it's kind of all-encompassing at this point. So, uh, well, it's it's become, you know, a pretty big part of my life now, so... Do you have a, if you had to pick a favorite Paradox game, let's say cur currently and all time can be separate. If you have one that's like your favorite right now and one that's your favorite overall. Currently, um, I get the most enjoyment out of playing Imperator. And yeah. that might be heresy to some people. Uh, whatever. <laughs> um, I'm with you. But right now, Imperator is the one that I get the most fun out of. All time, I mean... I've got five and a half thousand hours in EU4. It can't be anything else, really. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's. I think I'm up over twelve hundred in CK2 and EU4. I've never broken two thousand in any one game, but that's partly e because when you're actually when your games press, you have to play a lot of different games, and I don't really have a lot of time to as much time as I would like to play my favorites. Currently, EU4 is the only game that I've got that breaks 1,000. Oh, wow, okay. Five times over. 
Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> That's not bad, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Rose, how did you get started with all of this, all of this nonsense? Well, if we said about strategy, I've been playing that since I was in elementary school. Oh yeah, we can which... we can go back that far. We can throw it back that far. <laughs> we, we can go back that far to good old original Age of Empires one. There we go. Uh, but no, grand strategy, I would have to say, would be CK2 was my first exposure back in... Well, sorry, that's not really quite true. CK2 wasn't my first exposure. CK was, the original Crusader Kings. I think you might be the only one here that played CK1, is that right? I, I played it briefly. I okay, it briefly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've... For as much of a CK2 addict as I am, I have never played Crusader Kings 1. It's... Once you've played CK2, you can't go back... Yeah. It's so much of a change. But honestly, the only reason I played Crusader Kings was back in February or March 2012, Steam recommended this brand new game to me, Crusader Kings 2. And my laptop wouldn't run it. It wouldn't. Oh, wow. So I, I picked up Crusader Kings until I could upgrade my laptop a few months later and played that for about 60 hours. And then I've been playing that since then. Uh, found YouTubers, Quill18, and then Arumba, Mathis, Northern Lion, learned about EU4, gave that a try. There's not enough roleplay in EU4. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not really tailored to it, but I think, especially with Dharma, when they made characters a little bit more of a thing, you can kind of roleplay a little bit. I don't know. I roleplay like, I roleplay when I'm playing Tetris, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little extreme on that end. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what strategy game, good strategy games mean to me? It's a chance to sit down and kind of play a board game on a computer, but not yeah. as a board game. You know, it, it's like, it's time where you can sit there and you can pause and you can think out your turn or you can just have a really good time or you can play it with other people, which I honestly, I say, I think is one of the best ways to play certain paradox games like Hearts of Iron. Yeah. It's, Hearts it's of a Iron much better game great. with others. Mm -hmm. um, as for that, I've played... Yes, I've even played Vicky 2, the most... The oldest PDX game still around, but... Um, my favorites currently right now are Crusader Kings. Hopefully Crusader Kings 3 will be everything we've dreamed it will be. Um, <laughs> and then I have to say Solaris and Imperator come after that. Okay. My favorite games. And would that be, was that for just now, or do you have like a different answer if I said of all time? Of all time is Crusader Kings 2. Okay. Nonstop. Gotcha. It's, it's been my favorite since I started playing it. <laughs> that's the, that's, I mean, that's the objectively correct answer. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, incest uh, is wincest and all that. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. We, yeah, well, all right. Okay. We are first podcast. I'd like to say, yeah, we are. <laughs> We are slightly less than 15 minutes into the first episode, and already uh, incest has come into the discussion. So that, that doesn't take long at all. Um, all right. Uh, so, Loris, how did you get into this whole uh, this whole crazy mess? So I've been playing, like, Grand Strategy for years and years and years. Like, starting with, like, Shogun 1, like, on, like, my old CRT monitor computer when I was a kid. And I used to play, it like, multiplayer. I've always played Grand Strategy multiplayer. So I used to play, you know, Shogun multiplayer and then Civ 3 multiplayer a lot. And then Civ 4, I really got into, especially like modded Civ 4. I don't know if any of you played like Rise and Fall of Civilization or. Um, or yeah, no, Rise and Fall was amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's sublime. Is that the, yeah. brilliant. Was that the one? No, Clay, Caveman to Cosmos. Yes, that was brilliant too. Oh my goodness. Yes. My, my computer, when it's... I was really into it, just couldn't run it. It was that big, <laughs> to be honest. Oh, it took me like four hours to load up that game. <laughs> I have like a hundred something hours in Civ Four on Steam now, and it's all been in Caveman to Cosmos. I think, oh, yeah, nice. yeah. Same with me, but with Fall from Heaven was what I was really, really into. <laughs> oh, Fall Maybe from Heaven! Well, I did play Fall from Heaven. Yeah, oh, it was, oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's Civ Four had amazing. an amazing mod scene. <laughs> I really, only really, that really game good. Vanilla, so I'm lost here. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! If you, if you get the chance, like download some mods because it's it's a good game, Vanilla. But man, the the mod scene is just. See, just Civ Fantastic. 4 holds up. Like, even if you've played 5 and 6, 4 is a different enough game that I'd say, hey, give it a shot. You can probably get it with all the expansions for, like, $10 on Steam. Yeah, easily. Especially on sale. Or maybe I think, I think I'll GOG still. 
Yeah. Oh, it's got Steamworks now too. Like, so if you if you yeah. like me and you really like multiplayer, um, it it works really well. Um, because it was after like GameSpy shut down, I think. They used to like have this really clunky meta server. I think. Oh well, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I remember <laughs> well, that. And um, I think I think uh, Paradox used to have a clunky meta server too. Anyway, anyway, when when Civilization Five came out, um, I was brutally disappointed. I couldn't stand the game. It didn't work <laughs> me, at all. Like on either. launch, it was. Mm, it was Bad just game uh, at the multiplayer just couldn't didn't function at all. You couldn't save the game. You couldn't mod the game properly. I think like even now you can't mod the game that that well. I think you have to sort of trick it into thinking it's like DLC or something. I think that's the only way of getting mods to work on Civ Five. So. Oh that, really? That's... I haven't I haven't messed with that in a long time. Yeah. I've had to reinstall the game with Civ Five after uninstalling a mod because it doesn't work. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, I figure I think I've done the same. And it didn't even work when I installed it. So it's like I must have spent like me and my friend must have spent maybe like an hour and a half trying to get this mod to work what your player just didn't. Um anyway, it was that that frustration at Civ Five like started I started like looking around for like other grand strategy games that hadn't multiplayer that I could enjoy, and that's that's why I started playing uh, EU Free. I think it was like the first first one I played, and it had like a clunky meta server again that didn't work, but also it worked on Hamachi back when that was like a good program. Oh man, yeah, yeah. Oh, that brings I, back memories. The way to like <laughs> hack stuff that wasn't supposed to work over internet to actually get it to work over internet yeah uh, yeah. yeah that's right yeah you have to like trick it into thinking like on a LAN server or right something. yeah <laughs> yep um so i played that for years and years and years and then i got into like you know i started reaching out then i tried to play hearts of iron free and didn't understand it because i'm an idiot and um oh, oh. but i got into like ck2 and stuff and that's probably still my favorite i've been playing ever since not- paradox well, I've not Sorry. played Hoy 3, but I hear it's a lot more complex and micro than Hoy 4. I've seen screenshots. Yes. Uh, it's, so it's it's interesting because I would say, yes, it is more complex than Hoy 4, but there's also so much you can do to automate it that you can almost just have the entire war fight itself. So in a way, it's it's it can be less micro-y if you, if you just kind of like set everything up and forget it. Um, it's, it's kind of like a game about seeing if you can, you know, drop the Plinko ball in the right spot to win World War II <laughs> if you use all the automation stuff, because it's just like set it up and then, okay, you guys take over from here. Uh, Hoi 4 demands a little bit more direct control, uh, than, than Hoi 3 did. Would that not um, be I haven't played a lot of Hoi 3, hmm. but. I remember I had like this, this chain of command system. <laughs> So you'd spend like all of peace time like ch- setting up this right. intricate chain of command. You got like a HQ, maybe yeah. a region division, and then as soon as the war started, suddenly it just all went yeah. to shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like there's there's ten times as much stuff to do before you hit unpause, and then there's way less to do once you hit unpause. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, no plan yeah. f- survives first contact with the enemy, so in that way, I guess Hoi Four is a bit more realistic. Yeah. Uh, and then there's nice. there's people who still play Hearts of Iron 2 Darkest Hour and think that's the ultimate Hearts of Iron, which I haven't even played Darkest Hour or Hoi 2. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to have a Darkest Hour expert on here at some point to enumerate the fine differences between uh, between the three. I don't think anyone still stands for Hearts of Iron 1 as far as I know. But uh, no, no, I think so. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Loris, you said Crusader Kings is currently your favorite. Would you say it's your overall favorite too? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, it's it's probably I, I really like role playing and multiplayer generally, and generally that's that's the most fun to sort of like sort of have have a bit of a laugh with your mates. Really, so yeah, other games kind of work like that. Way. Hearts of Iron is good for that too, but not me, my friends. Are into Hearts of Iron, I guess, but I do love it. But like you know, I'm just trying to get my friends into it too, which is a bit more difficult. Um, yeah, so CK2 for me. Got it. Definitely. And hopefully with CK3, we'll have much better multiplayer because think of all the fun shenanigans. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah with definitely. the new like the new plotting system, that's going to be great. Oh, and hot join. That's what I really want. Yes, <laughs> it yes. will have hot join. I heard it's going to be similar to the Imperator multiplayer setup. 
I yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's just I seamless. Don't like the Imperator multiplayer setup <laughs> thing. It's I'd rather the game forced a pause to get the people in because otherwise you just have desyncs and yeah, well, I, that's something I, to suggest now, honestly, and hopefully. Yeah, I haven't played it. I really haven't played much Imperator multiplayer. I have one like two player game going with a friend of mine, but I haven't I haven't tested any of the like advanced stuff they added for that. I've hosted um, two 30 plus player multiplayers over uh, oh wow. from, both together about 20 weeks and been a part of another one around about the same size for another eight weeks or so. So I've got a fair bit of experience with uh, with how it works. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of desync issues still that need to be ironed out, mm. but it's worth it. Yep, I, I haven't played it since 1.0 with multiplayer. Was that that big uh, one that Midge set up? Uh, yes, and then I did uh, another one on my Discord. Uh huh. As well. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to ask uh, you, Laura, specifically, uh, since a lot of people know you from the Chapel comics, do you remember like when you got the idea to do those, and like kind of how how it turned into a big thing? Um. Well, I've been drawing like little comics and stuff for like as long as I can remember, uh -huh. to be honest. I used to be um I used to be a really cool kid and I used to go on 4chan when I was uh, when I was in high school. <laughs> oh uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's how cool I was. And I used All to the like cool kids. <laughs> that's right. And I used to like um draw comics and put it on there and then used to be like Fred's back in the day where like everyone would critique each other's comics and I'd go in like something awful and put the comics on there and like also pretend that they weren't mine and also critique my own comics, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, that's always fun when you, you claim something isn't your work so that you can see people's reaction to it without them reacting to you. Yeah, and yeah. also you can slag it off yourself then, which is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh, it's terrible drawing, terrible. It's not funny. <laughs> like, um, yeah. You can sort of play devil's advocate with it. It was um, So I did that for years, and um, I used to just really uh, not like Reddit at all and my friend said oh we've, we've cleaned up our act we've gotten rid of a lot of terrible boards that i really didn't like about about Reddit. yeah and um so i posted my comic on there once um and it was it was more popular than i thought it would be so i i started posting posting on reddit a lot more and kind of kind of grew from there but yeah if, um it was just accidental, really. Just <laughs> what was the first? Because I remember the first one I saw was the Finnmark Center of Reformation one. That uh, was that the first one you posted, or were you posting other stuff before that? I think the first one I posted was a Victoria Two One uh, uh -huh. on Reddit, where it was like um, I think like a Greek was asking the UK to like um, ask, asking for help in a war and. And the UK was just sitting on its island doing nothing while Turkey was slaughtering. Oh, yeah, I've, I have seen that one. Yeah. yeah, I think that was the first one I put in Reddit. Yeah, yeah. No, I. It's it's. And we actually first started discussing this podcast at Paradox Con 2018. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so it, was it was a like good while May ago. Of last year, we finally got down to recording it. But yeah, I always <laughs> liked that that. Uh, uh, Loris and I work in two different mediums, but I felt like we have kind of. The same wavelength of like recognizing the absurdities contained within these game mechanics that are like ostensibly supposed to be simulating a real world. That's yeah. basically when I write what the patch notes really mean. I'm like thinking, <laughs> I was okay, about if, to I was, say, if I was, if I look at those patch notes and going, oh, we, those could have been comic ideas. Yeah, <laughs> <I could've... laughs> hey, you're free to use them anytime. Uh, but yeah, like just the perspective of like someone on the ground in this world. How would they? react to this change that the gods have wrought upon the workings of the universe yeah, or yeah. whatever <laughs> absolutely um, again i'm the I, I role play even when i'm playing tetris so that's always that's always what i'm thinking about is <laughs> numbers yeah. optimization eh, i want to know i want to i want to pick out the stories basically yeah same i'm um, exactly the same yeah which that's that's really kind of not even just strategy games but games in general that's kind of why they've been such a big part of my life from the very beginning is i'm really interested in stories and i think games tell stories in some really interesting ways that non-interactive mediums can't necessarily 
And it doesn't think- it doesn't even necessarily have to be interactive because we were talking about like time lapses and stuff. Like those are stories too. It's just created by a simulation without your input. Yeah. Uh, what were you gonna say, Rose? Up- I think jumping off of that is probably why, you know, people have two, three, four thousand hours in a lot of the Paradox Grand Strategy games is because every time you hit the unpause button, you start a new story. Right. It's not like pulling up Dragon Age and replaying it again where you're just a slightly like there's possibly, you know, you're slightly more evil characters. You just go with the evil people. It's still Mm -hmm. a very similar story. Right. Yeah, there's... You open up EU4 and you decide to play as Ulm and go on to conquer the world. That's like you're David fighting Goliath. Right. Or you decide to be the Ottomans and conquer the whole world and or not even conquer the world. Just sit there and conquer all of Europe and say, OK, now who's crusading who? <laughs> <laughs> right. I like to describe um, EU4 as an A history simulator because the game yeah. is historically accurate only until you on hit. Uh, until you yeah. get pause and anything yeah, else is up in the air. His- historically accurate for one day in November in the year 1444. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, example, even like CK2 today, I was playing and because of Crusader shenanigans, I was playing as a Duke in Wales and suddenly became King of Egypt. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. So I do. I really like that. So like you do. By the like you do. Swath of Egypt. The best yeah. thing to do in Secret 2 is just marry a load of people, and then suddenly you're, you're sort of playing like a duke somewhere randomly, and like, yeah. oh, well, I've inherited Persia. <laughs> How did oh, this man. happen? And that's <laughs> something I really like about like the new uh, CK3. You know, I think that's that's encouraged, right? It's like, yeah. The, uh, yes. Yeah. Getting yeah, your the- dynasty on other thrones is going to be a lot more rewarding now. So yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward especially to that, especially. With- as long as you can hold on to being the dynastic head. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think one of my my most fun games of CK2, even though it was also somewhat tedious, was starting as a random count with no blood ties to the royal line in France and secretly, secretly converting to Shia, becoming the Grand Master of the Assassins and just experimenting with how many people theoretically would I need to kill to become king? Because eventually, if everyone's dead, it'll just be me left, right? Like how how many how how many what where? Let's find out where I am in line for the throne. Um, yeah, and that that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, as far as how I get onto paradox games, it was actually I was a huge Civilization player for many many years. I liked Civ Five. It sounds like better than than. Uh, you guys maybe did uh, <laughs> I, mostly. I I've, I've, I've just got a vendetta for it. <laughs> mostly, okay, most, <laughs> mostly once the expansion. Five. I just couldn't play it when it came out. It was yeah, just, yeah. Well, the launch oh. builds kind of like Imperator was a little bit rough. So uh, yes, yeah. The the expansions made it a lot better. Um, yeah, my first strategy game was actually Warcraft Two. Uh, way back in Ooh. the day. Oh, yeah, you remember then, the the map you could load up with the sheep, and you had oh, to yeah. kill the sheep so you could build buildings. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah no, that was great. <laughs> that was ridiculously fun at ten years old. <laughs> oh yeah, um, but yeah, Civ through my interest in history kind of um, became like my main game for many years. I didn't even know who Paradox was until 2012. I mean, I'd seen like magazine ads for Sengoku and Victoria Two. But I don't know. They kind of they. I'm 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 one of those people who's distracted by shiny things. And if I see a screenshot that you know looks like you know a war game from 2001, I'm probably not going to linger on it for too long. <laughs> um, so I mean, even CK2 when it, that first came out, I remember being like, yeah, the, I mean that sounds interesting, but it kind of looks it, it doesn't look very good. So I didn't give it give it much mind at first. But I was doing. Basically, an AAR series. Um, when I was an intern at PC Gamer in 2012, in Civilization Five, um, and eventually I kind of got bored of Civ Five, and I was like, okay, if I'm going to move on to another game, uh, to write these these diaries about, uh, what do you guys think? And Crusader Kings Two was like one of the top suggestions. And I remember Tyler Wild, uh, he may know, you guys may know he's still at PC Gamer. Um, 
asked me if I'd ever heard of Crusader Kings 2, so he was kind of like the first person who turned me on to it. And I bounced off of it for a while, and then finally, like, when I kind of realized the implications of the character interaction, something clicked, and, you know, now it's not only my game of the decade, but I would probably say it's the number one strategy game of all time. Um, and, yeah, that's what I have the most hours in. It's, like, my whole career since then has kind of been about Crusader Kings. Um, I think Crus <laughs> Crusader Kings broke a few boundaries, just even going back to the original one, because these were things that were in the original, is the fact that you're playing as a family, not as a nation. Mm -hmm. And so the characters right. are much, much more important. It's almost right. like you're playing The Sims kind of, but in a strategy game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's how I tell it to people. It's like if you play, a, yes. it's like The Sims meets Civilization, if you want to play that. It's like, and that's just a perfect game as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, it was also a pioneer in, in normalizing incest, so. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you go by my top five games of all of I've played, it goes from CK2 to Sims 4, Stardew Valley, and then like Civ 5, I think. And there's something I, else in there. Yeah, I, used to I can see the common elements there. Yeah, I love Stardew as well. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, Stardew's incredible. I gotta yes. say, when oh, I yes. was playing Civ 4, and then I found CK2, I don't think I picked up Civ again until Civ 6 came out. Um, because, How? yeah, I the the world kind of lost its luster in Civ. Yeah. And mm. now, instead of being a the British Empire in a land that looks nothing like Earth, I was the British Empire in a land that was the British Empire. And it said the British Empire on it. And that, that just clicked for me. I, I love that part of it. And yeah, I didn't really go back to Civ after that. Ah, oh, you see, that's yeah. why you have to play modded Civ because Rise and Fall of Civilization. That's there that's you what go. It did. Mods is definitely so something we want to yeah. be talking about at some point. <laughs> yes, but Lambert, I'm actually surprised you've never played a Civ mod, considering I don't think you ever play it in a Paradox game that's not modded. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I I'm I'm fairly sure I did play Civ mods, but for the life of me, I can't remember the names of any of them, and none of the ones you were saying were ringing any bells. Uh, but if you want to talk it about like mods, built, then oof, uof, uh, we can get into that <laughs> if you like. <laughs> it was like built-in ones, I think. There was one bit like you played in space. Now, if you ever played that multiplayer, that was great because um, there was like these things called stealth ships that you could get that had hidden nationality and they were invisible. So if you were playing multiplayer, of course, <laughs> all you did was build those things <laughs> and go around annoying all your friends with these stealth ships. I do remember nice. playing an Elder Scrolls mod. Oh, for yep. Civ for, for, yeah, uh, for Civ. Those are those are really good CK. Interesting. I played. Yeah, Elder Kings. I've Elder played Kings. that. Elder yeah. Kings is fantastic. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's one of right. the the top ones after like Game of Thrones, or after the mm -hmm. end mod. My favorite CK two yeah. mod would probably be Geheimnisnacht because I'm yeah, a so big Warhammer fan. That's, that's my favorite too. I was going to say it, but I don't I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> so, I love Geheimnisnacht. I love Warhammer, but like I, I, I feel like when with Total War Warhammer existing, I'm not as interested in a Warhammer mod hmm. for CK2. But I don't know. I should I should give it a fair shot. I think I was a little bit underwhelmed by how different, like the different fantasy races are handled hmm. in Elder Kings, because obviously they did what they could, but the engine isn't really designed for that to work. <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe maybe CK three will make it a little bit easier to mod various fantasy races into. It would be uh, interesting so. with CK three modding in because of the three D portraits. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think it's just yeah. going to mean there's going to be a lot more. Well, not a lot more, but there's going to be fewer character mods. But the ones that we do get will be of a much higher quality. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. sure about that? <laughs> well, there there will also probably be some very bad ones. Probably. Too. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure there will be about a dozen anime mods in the first week or two after it comes oh, out. Man. Let's be fair, the yeah. nude mods are coming first. Oh, well, the nude mod and the anime mod might be the same thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the Venn diagram for that is pretty... <laughs> yeah, it's just exactly. a circle. Of it. it's just yeah, a circle. it is a circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... um so yeah, I hope I hope like modded uh, Civ 
uh, CK3 works properly, multiplayer. That's a big thing. So that's yeah. the biggest problem I have for CK2 I multiplayer. I know it's CK3 stable. mods and multiplayer. I did talk with um, Black Ninja some at PDXCon, and he said it's going to be similar in terms of Imperator and that everyone has to have the same mod. Mm-hmm. And that goes even just, you know, for little UI mods. But yeah. there was talk if they can work it out to do a softer sort of level where you can agree that, oh, yes, uh, Lambert is running a colorblind mod. Is Are you okay with him having that and you not having that? Okay, that would be that would be cool. That would oh, be that would be, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's like a check who knows thing, if they'll figure so. out how to do that or not by the time the game launches because I'm sure it's not the highest priority <laughs> yeah <No. laughs> but yeah I had a I had a very similar relationship with with Civ I think to to Lambert where it's like when I found CK2 and EU4 they ended up scratching most of the same itches that Civ used to scratch but better so I don't play as much Civ anymore. Like, I, I have 75, maybe 80 hours in Civ 6, and I honestly don't think that's because Civ 6 is a bad game. I think it's because what I was looking to Civilization for all those years is just provided better by Paradox games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I feel that. I don't know. For the Civ games, I always liked the the early stages when you're trying to colonize and build your cities and get the perfect layout. Mm-hmm. The end game, the end game was kind of lacking, I guess, especially when you compare it to games like EU or Hoi. Yeah. In terms of the interactions, or Stellaris, even Stellaris has a lot more end game stuff than you could do in the Civ game. My biggest problem, my with personal Civ opinion, was yeah, yeah. mostly the having real nations in ahistorical locations. So that's why one of the big reasons that I prefer uh, Paranos games. But it's also the reason that I think my favorite Civ game is actually Beyond Earth. Because it really? Get, yeah. Yeah. Because I don't have that disconnect where I'm seeing Spain be a, a landlocked dude living in snow mountains or, or some, you know, seeing nations where they shouldn't be. And that kind of disconnect was, it was too much for me. So, yeah, Beyond Earth is my favorite because. That huh. doesn't that doesn't Yeah, I See? wasn't a huge fan of Beyond Earth, but that's an interesting way to put it. Because I I felt like the, the historical context in Civ made me more interested into it, even though it's a little bit ridiculous. It's more like a big it's more like a big history themed board game. I think that's how we described it on 3MA well, last time we talked about it. It's not historical. It's 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 not historical. It's history themed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think well, I did. Earth, like, oh, oh, Beyond Earth kind of fell flat for me because I played Alpha Centauri a lot. Yeah, that's what I was about to say too. <laughs> that's just, that's yeah, just I've heard that a lot. Much more detailed and richer game especially i think beyond earth had the same bugs or not the same bugs but it had a lot of bugs like civ 5 did yeah. including you know ai from two continents away getting angry at you for settling a city too close to them yeah and also i think it was something to do about the immersion with the factions you know it's like i don't feel like i remember half the factions on on in civilization beyond earth it was, it was like Brazil. i can't remember three. any of them the, well there was three like paths to go but even more than Beyond Earth, there are the games that do the same kind of civilization model, like you're colonizing, you're growing your cities, you're building a new city. Um, Age of Wonders, Planetfall, and Endless Legend. Yeah. They do oh, yes. everything that Civ does without that disconnect for me. And I, think I agree. I love both of those games. Yes. Better games. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the adding probably... in of the heroes in the Age of Wonders series yeah. adds mm-hmm. that actual extra personal sort of like role play that you just don't quite get it with a lot of 4x games yeah for sure yeah yeah so we've talked a little bit about who we are um hopefully that helps help those of you who don't know us get to know us or get to know us better um the next thing we are going uh to do this will usually be at the top of the show um but we're, we're kind of doing it late because this is a weird pilot episode is we're going to talk about <clears throat> the latest dev diaries that have come out since our last episode. Um, since this is our first episode, it'll just be like the last four or five that came out. Um, 
using my college newspaper editor training, I have not exactly arbitrarily arranged these where uh, we'll start with games that aren't out yet, so CK3, and then go in release order. Um, let me see if I can uh, pull up so you can, you guys can see what I'm seeing on uh, on the good old OBS there. All right. Um, so we had a pretty significant CK2 dev diary this week uh, talking about um, character traits and portraits. It looks like there's some returning stuff. Looks like there's some uh, some new stuff as well. We got uh, another look at how the 3D portraits are coming along, which uh, to me, it looks like like this is the nicest they've ever looked. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys saw the the original demo. They were they were not quite as uh, spiffy looking as they are now. Um, no, we've got the anti aliasing sorted now, so <laughs> yeah, which like a very jagged edge. I was kind of trying to tell everybody that when when the first screenshots came out is like look at the first screenshots of CK2 and how bad Ooh. it looked compared to what mm. actually came out. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I know there was a Reddit post of that where people were comparing. Yeah. It's you know, games it's still over, what about a year out probably. Probably maybe a little a, less. Yeah, maybe a little less than a year. I wouldn't be Third surprised if it quarter. got delayed. Yeah. Um uh they uh, want to make this perfect. <laughs> uh, I have a bit of a controversial opinion about the, the portraits in CK3. Yeah. And it's to do with the clothes more than anything. Um, it, I, I think some of the clothes are a bit too shiny. And I know satin exists and I've been told, oh, it's satin. You just have a different taste. But kind of looks like Harold Godwinson is, is wearing a plastic bag. <laughs> and, <laughs> it is. And, and that was the fashion at the time. Yeah, Harry yeah. Godwinson used to go down Tesco's and um, he's, pick he's up his wearing plastic his bike. leather dancing outfit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plastic didn't exist back then. Oops. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that's my controversial opinion. But everything else, I really like about it. Well, yeah, it's if you're a little shiny. Compare it to Princess uh, Sweeto. I can't say with the with the. Uh, yeah, so I'm not gonna Slava. try any. I'm not gonna try any Slavic names ever. <laughs> no, no. But the green on her outfit, it looks like it could be wool. Oh yeah, yeah. her. And it's, then perhaps, and then everywhere else, it could be like she has gold embroidery around the um the collars. The yeah. best looking guy is that monk. If you scroll down a little bit, oh yeah, <laughs> this guy, yeah. look at that yeah. man. <laughs> Yeah. He's like an orange. Look at him. He's kind of he looks lackey. He looks like yeah. he just no, he looks like he just woke up and realized he's in Crusader Kings and he's like, oh no. <laughs> what? <laughs> like Jumanji or something. He's like, yeah. yeah. I'm dead. Yeah. Um Yeah. Uh anything uh any anything specific that they mentioned stick out uh from this dev diary for you guys? Uh, not so much for I mentions, love... but I just love the art, the icons. Yeah, yes. I mean, like, like the art for gorgeous. the traits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Compare it to what we had in CK two or even CK one, which are both very, very pixelated. This right. is just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that's something like Paradox Games until like Stellaris and Imperator with the map. They weren't exactly pretty games. Mm. No. They were very fun, but they weren't, you couldn't just sit there and go, oh, wow, that's gorgeous. I could just, you know, make a screen capture for my background. Mm -hmm. Right. These, yeah. these are gorgeous. I want full size versions of all of them. <laughs> mm. Let's see. I quite like how there's only three in each character too. So you can, you can instantly look at the character's uh, profile and go, right, mm -hmm. he's a, he's a cowardly, lustful hedonist. You know, it's like, that's it. I know that person. I can, I can, honestly, I can create a, a, an image of his character in my mind, you know, like from that. This honestly kind of reminds me of The Sims 4. Yes, How yeah, it is. How your Sims <laughs> only have a certain number of traits. <laughs> That's right, they're like hot-headed and, and slob and stuff like that, mm -hmm. yeah. And they, yeah, and then there's other things that they can gain throughout the game, but they don't affect their base personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really good equivalent, did, right? Like. By the way, sorry to chat. Compare. I guess I guess I have to actually click into Hangouts to update the page so you can actually see what we're seeing. Uh, <laughs> so we'll we'll figure out a better way to do that in the future because uh, yeah, OBS isn't isn't quite co cooperating on that. Um, yeah, let me let me show you the monk dude real quick. I'll 
I'll fix this in the edit for everybody else. But uh, yeah, this this uh, this gentleman uh, right here is who we're referring to. Eden oh, there Peele. we go. Now it's scrolling correctly. <laughs> the pair of a man. Look at him. He's like, yeah, yeah. exactly. And you got you got to show Mr. Plastic Bag there, King Harold. Oh as yeah, well. and yeah, Harold Godwinson. He's he's. <laughs> He's got a lot of he's got a lot of shiny going on. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's ready to go clubbing. He is. <laughs> yeah, big time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, does anyone so, else agree with me that Cecile de Normandy, the girl, the girl that's next to um, the fat friar, looks a little bit like Greta Thunberg? She kind of does. Yeah. 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 I yeah. can see the resemblance. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see um, it. <laughs> yeah. And then, then of course, Earl Darmot, who I'm very familiar with from uh, having played in Ireland in 1066 a lot, CK2, he's he's absolutely done with it. I've never mm -hmm. played in <laughs> yeah, <any he's> Ireland. <laughs> I've only ever conquered it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's it can be some good fun. Um, yeah. Another spineless uh, atheist up there at the top, Duke Ordolf. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, atheist. I, oh, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> Yeah. I don't care. Do whatever. It doesn't matter. We're all no, gonna I, die. I mentioned on Twitter that that <laughs> from the description, spineless atheist and just kind of his general hairstyle, he kind of looks like he should be like a political YouTuber in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> See, when I when I did my I, dev diary video, I said I felt personally attacked by that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I do love I do love those like two phrase like descriptions that they have though. Oh, know, oh those like, are great! Can, like, mm -hmm. oh, it's it's fantastic. And apparently, there's quite a lot of them, right? So, like, what's that fearless ravener? Like, oh, what a <laughs> what a great thing to have your character described as, you know? And he looks like it as well. He like, really does. He looks fearless. He and he looks. <laughs> He looks like a ravener. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know what a he, ravener looks like, but he looks like him. To, to me, he looks like a like a, a taller version of Lord Farquaad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he's not compensating for anything. No, no, he looks like you know he doesn't need to. But it's all uh, in the hair. well, you also look. He's got eighteen Marshall. Yeah, yeah. he's a pretty good character. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, fun like trying to guess what like the, um, he just wants money. Well, he is yeah, level four too, education on his uh, stewardship, so. Mm -hmm. So we're we're probably going to do a full episode about the paradox DLC policy at some point in the future because it's we we were discussing before the show it's it's kind of an elephant in the room when we we're you know talking about <laughs> paradox development studio. But what do you guys think they're actually going to sell? Like, is it is it going to be clothing packs? Is it going to be backgrounds? Like, there's so many different. With this new engine, like visual accoutrements, mm. they could potentially, you know, mm. things that don't change how you play it, but right. they change how the game looks to you. Or will I they even do that? Because lately they've been putting unit packs and stuff into the gameplay DLCs instead of selling them separately. Yeah, I think that's the direction it looks like they're going in. I assume. Mm -hmm. So I reckon they'll carry on that to to CK three. I assume. Well, when I was talking mm. with Johan at ParadoxCon. Um, he said that for him personally, he felt felt that um, all mechanical changes, uh, the way you play the game, should be part of the patches. And that's what he wanted to bring Imperator in uh, going forward. And then the things that you pay for would be the fluff and the, you know, that kind of thing instead of, you know, mechanical stuff. So you wouldn't end up with a, a case like EU4 got itself in where development came in and you couldn't develop if you didn't have the DLC and it was a real crappy situation for a long time for people who did, couldn't afford it so mm -hmm. I yeah. hope the rest of Paradox are kind of thinking the same way as he is and we won't Christina see Kings. yeah we, we won't see mechanical changes being paid for that's what my hope is yeah if I don't Christina know who makes Kings first decisions in issues. Paradox mind oops that's too big in terms yeah. of uh with Crusader Kings, I know a lot of the Cassus Belli are locked behind DLC. Uh, retinues, being able to rally your troops in a certain place, being able to sort your prisoners. Yeah. Getting claims from the Pope. Yeah, I don't think they'll do that again. Cassus Belli. That, they got the that same all falls under EU. different DLC. Yeah, they have a problem with EU4 too, right? With like lots of different things. So yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It's I good. don't think they'll do yeah. that with their new games because, like, I don't no, think they well, haven't been Stellaris. doing it with Hearts of Iron, for example. You know, and they haven't been doing that with Stellaris either. Yeah, and those are the two newer games of the the decade. Yeah, I think they've learned their mistake with those two, definitely. Yep, and well, Stellaris yeah. has been very good about putting out free content <coughs> with, you know, like. Well, give Megacorps last year as an example. Megacorps literally just gave you the ability to play as Megacorps. All the other stuff that came out with it was part of the free patch. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, any final thoughts on uh, on CK, CK3 Dev Diary before we move on to EU4? I just want to know what everyone's favorite icon is. <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> oh, let's see. <laughs> question. I like the chicken. I do, I do oh, like the chicken's the, a good one. Uh, yeah, the happy dog for loyal. I I'm a fan of that, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I'm a dog fan. Um, let me see. I quite like stubborn. Kind. It's my favorite by far. I quite <laughs> I like, like the kind. donkey. Oh, the chastity belt. Though yeah, historically, chastity belt those too. chastity belts were not really a thing until someone made them as a, like a gag gift in the 1700s. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yep. They were totally just gag gifts, and then they got put back into people's ideas Historical, about yeah. the time period. Yeah. It's fair. Um, I quite yeah. like Ambitious, yep. the, the chess piece. And, oh, yeah. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> oh, that's where it is, of course. I was yeah. trying to work or out what that is. King, yeah. I thought it was like Game Master or something. It's like, that's not a personality trait, is it? Like, And I, and I quite like yeah. Kind, the one with the butterfly, because it reminds me of my great-grandmother. Oh. Yeah. Aww. That's cool. Yeah. What do you think the fig leaf is? Is that just like Peaceful I don't know. What? We were trying to figure that out. Like maybe it's groomed, or I, I don't know. It could be something new that just doesn't exist in CK two. That's a fake. I I assumed it was an olive branch. Now I think the four bottom ones are child ones. Oh yeah, definitely. The the one yeah. on the far yeah. right yeah. is playful. Erudite yeah, for the so. book. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, the forum has it as it could be forgiving for the olive branch. Yeah, Ag- Agmede in in chat said uh, mm-hmm. it might be forgiving. Yeah, the yeah, the forum yeah. also had one. the the magnifying glass there. Um, they thought that was chaste. No, no, no absolutely not. Inquisitive. It has to be inquisitive. The belt. Yeah, yeah. yeah this this has got to be chaste up here. Yeah, that could be yeah. inquisitive. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll be uh, we'll be keeping up to date with uh, the latest dev diaries on. Uh, Basically, all the PDS games, as long as they come out before Wednesday morning. Um, so EU4, the last dev diary of the year, and it was oh, a pretty now big this is a one. Good one. <laughs> it was chunky. Uh, so my my theory is that this is this next expansion is going to be the Holy Fury of EU4. I actually think they're wrapping it up. Um, I think EU5 might be closer than we think, which is part of why I didn't bet for Victoria 2 to be in or Victoria 3 to be announced <laughs> in 2020 because I actually legitimately think EU5 is going to be announced in 2020. I originally um, didn't, but having seen your opinion on it before, I was like, you know what? Yeah. You're you're kind of on something. That's why I also didn't choose 2020. After 2020, it could be 2021, which is where my guess right. is. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. So, so I mean, Jake, Jake, uh, DDR, Jake left. I think that's probably because either Martin or Johan or someone was already working on EU five, and he felt like he didn't have anything to do. This is all my speculation. I don't have any insider information. This is just my conspiracy theory. <laughs> um. Uh. A a a former Paradox staff person actually told me at the con that oh yeah, EU EU four is kind of getting the the Holy Fury treatment with this next expansion. So they didn't specifically say this is going to be the last DLC, but they said the words Holy Fury treatment. So, um, that's yeah, that's, that's what makes me think that. Um, also, the fact that Johan used to say in a lot of interviews that he thought we would never need to have an EU5 because um, Johan Anderson, I should specify, there's multiple Johans at Paradox, but I assume <laughs> like I assume most... Yeah. Most paradox half people. Johans, if I, Jones. if you exactly, if I just say Johan, you probably know who I'm talking about. Um, he used to say, "I don't think there's any need for an EU five because we could just expand EU four forever." But more recently, he said, "Maybe there will be an EU five at some point in the future." He's also said, "I am not going to make any more games with mana in them," which would be a good reason to make EU five unless they're planning on redoing EU four without mana, which seems like it would be a oh. huge. I, I want I want Especially E5 to not have any mana. 
Oh, yeah. please. EU4 is a seven-year-old game. Be, yeah, I mean, it, it will be... Well, six if and they, a half. If they announce it at in, like, October of next year, EU5 will be, have been announced about as long after EU4 as CK3 was after CK2. Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. And both of them are the two, two, the two of them, and then Hoy are the three big heavy hitters for right. Paradox Games. Um, but yeah, so we're getting a big European fo focused expansion, and this dev diary went over. Uh, they're changing how the revolution and revolution targets work now. Uh, you're going to have like centers of revolution, the same way you would have, uh, um, like Reformation. centers of reformation. Mm -hmm. You can steal the revolution target from ever other revolutionary nations. What do you guys think? I, I really oh, like so late game Age of Revolutions in U4 personally. Yeah, same. And I think this like solves a lot of the problems I had with that. I thought I, I didn't expect this at all. I was expecting this mm -hmm. to be like a whole separate thing and we would have like this grand revolution song. Um because it's the biggest war that happens in, in its time period that they haven't really fleshed right. out. But the biggest problem I had was you couldn't have multiple revolutionary areas. And now I think you can. You'll have one target, if I understand right. the Dev Diary properly. Uh, but you also have multiple revolutionary states. So if you're playing a game, you've basically got two sides. You've got the reactionaries and the revolutionaries. Right. And you've got one revolutionary target and a load of little revolutionary lackeys who also want to be the revolutionary target at the same time. But it has a very interesting dynamic to that point where it was, where it was yeah. It's going to really spice up multiplayer. A lot, Big, because yeah. revolutionary target was something that, if you could, uh, well, I mean, you knew exactly when it could pop up, so you could game it so that you could get it within like a few months of that happening, and then for the rest of the game, you are unbelievably overpowered, yeah, to the point where I mean, the multiplayer is kind of over. And no, <laughs> I don't have any experience with this whatsoever. <laughs> um, friends um but yeah so i think it's going to be really fun to see it shake up multiplayer um so that yeah you might get the revolutionary target but you might not keep it i was i was going to make a comic about that at some point it's been on my list for ages but the fact that you sort of have to ruin your own country at, right. at the moment well it so was like... clearly it was like clearly set up as something that will happen to the ai and will never happen to the player unless you specifically jump through a bunch of hoops to make it happen. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't like that because it's like, well, who doesn't want to be Napoleon? That's like the the that's the fun little overpowered ride across Europe you get at the end of the game. Exactly. Um, so you could you, you could be like kicking ass as France and then like right. when the age of revolution hits, it's like, oh, I'm just gonna randomly take out eight hundred loans now. And also I'm yeah. gonna like war deck people and go lower my stability <laughs> randomly. You know it's the same thing <laughs> just with to, like same thing with absolutism. Awesome. You you know when absolutism is coming. So oh, I'm just going to really piss off all of the peasants and particularists so that I can get them to um, <laughs> fire. I'm going to accept their demands. Oh, now I can uh, lower autonomy in all these places with negative 100 unrest. <laughs> oh, look, yep, yep. all of my um, absolutism is just shot right up. And now I'm set for the rest of the game. <laughs> like, there's too many things that you can really game, and I don't like that. Gaming. Ch I love that they're replacing. I love that they're replacing absolutism with guillotine power. Oh, that's yeah. that's very <laughs> on brand for me. I th I'm I'm gonna enjoy uh, getting to play with that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Any other thoughts about this dev diary before we uh, move on to Stellaris? I like the changes to uh, the succession from Burgundy as well. Oh yeah, that oh, was course, like a. Yeah. I was I was actually joking with some friends about if you can get excited as I am about uh, a dev diary about the changes to the Burgundian succession in EU4, we could probably be friends. <laughs> um, yeah, they're 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 making it a lot more dynamic. It looks like they're going to make it a lot more fun if you're actually playing as Burgundy. Yeah, now there's actually something a little bit. Right. I hope it's just a bit more transparent because, like at the moment, it's. Unless you know how the mechanics work, probably not going to be able to predict who's going to get the succession. It's a bit true. Random. 
That's like like whenever you're but, playing Spain, you're just hoping at all times you're going to get that beautiful Spanish low countries that everyone wants. But like, but if if you don't read all the dev diaries, you're a confirmed scrub anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> or or you can listen to us. See, we will elevate you out of scrubdom without having to read through all of this text. <laughs> the thing is, if you're you know you're driving to work, you can't exactly be reading the dev diaries. True. Yeah. But mm-hmm. you can listen to a podcast. Exactly. Yeah. Uh. Exactly. Um, Stellaris this week, um, we got a look oh, at, uh, the new Juggernaut awesome. ships, which are basically, beautiful. they're, they're, uh, they're kind of like a mobile star base is what it seems like. Like they can fabricate ships on the front lines, which I think seems like it's going to open up some really cool, uh, strategic possibilities. What did you guys think well, about all of this? Not just strategic, but one of the... Bigger problems I know I have with Stellaris when you get towards the later game is just the distance yeah. of getting yeah. ships to where you need them to be. Yeah. Especially if you know you're like, oh, I just got brand new weapons and I want to retrofit all of my battleships. And my battleships are on the front line because I'm about to yeah. go to war. And my best star base that can actually upgrade them is, you know, 20 jumps away. You can have a juggernaut and do the work for you right there on the border. See, I think the best thing about it know. is um, just these ships look so fucking beautiful. Yeah, I love yeah. Them. everything in Stellaris looks beautiful. <laughs> like uh, the one, the one further down the page uh, on the Let's you know the see. yellow. That oh god, I love that. Especially with like the floating oh, this one D right twenty yeah. in the middle. Like oh man, it's so yeah. gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, I think that's for shipyard, mm-hmm. right? That one. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, building one just shipyard. for the looks. God, I love oh that yeah, thing. the mega shipyards, which I'm really curious if this will bring back the Corvette spam meta, because I'm thinking about just having oh. a mega shipyard that's just constantly churning out Corvettes throughout the war. So like the ones that are at the front line are assumed already dead, but we just have like 40 more in each system along the way. <laughs> so, so now <laughs> we just, just need a manpower pool in Stellaris, so you can't do that. Because who are you sending out in these Corvettes now? Who is manning them? I, I, you just have... You just have AIs. You have one guy on each ship. That's all you need. For the, yeah, for the robots. It's like you online, there's one guy in a pod, right? <laughs> yeah, we've it. got the uh, the networking uh, software from the F-35 where it's supposed to be able to control like five to six drones or something, and that justifies that we spent a hundred trillion dollars on it or whatever. So what, what do the yeah. spiritualists do then? Because they don't like AI. Psychic. You could have psychically controlled no, right. warships. You, you've convinced me. I, I like to imagine like every ship's got like a little sanctuary okay. where everyone's. No, like- yeah. <laughs> Think about this. You've got one. You've got one fighter that's a manned fighter, and then around it, being controlled telekinetically with Jedi powers, are just a whole bunch of like independently floating assault cannons. But then, yeah. what happens if uh, you know they decide to take down the one fighter that has a person on it? Yeah, I mean, you do get some bonus kills for that. That's true. Well, that's we're, an, we're, well, that's a, just a sniper, isn't it? You, you, you we're talking about then. a weapon system that has mm-hmm. a definite weak point to it. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So you've turned your entire battle strategy into basically <laughs> the same as the Tyranids. You, you kill the leader, they all die. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I'm not asking if it's going to work. I'm asking if it's cool, which I think it very <laughs> obviously yeah. well, is. A lot of... A lot of <laughs> No argument there. I think a lot of the joy in Stellaris comes from imagining what we, what what things yeah. actually work like, you know, like Well Stellaris is like watching Star Wars or Star Trek or any other sci fi based Battlestar Galactica, I guess, something. And then you're in the game, you're playing it, which it has that role play aspect that people just really you know, games are a form of escapism. And Stellaris gives you that sci-fi escapism while still making you think and activating you. Yeah. Mind you, I, I don't actually play Stellaris that often. What I do, I spend, I've got a lot of hours in Stellaris, but what I do is mainly just make new civilizations and then like play it for like two seconds and then go back to the civilization maker and make another one. And then that's basically 90% of my time in Stellaris, I would say. I've I've never played a a default empire in Stellaris. It's only ever been custom ones for me. Oh, yeah. Who plays default empires? That's like half 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 the fun fun for me. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Making the empire. If the empire doesn't have a cool backstory, I'm not interested. 
Exactly. I mean, if someone yeah. does, you know, play default empires, tweet us, tell us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will chastise I don't know you. That does. <laughs> I'll just say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you doing this? <laughs> right. No, I'd be like, it's interesting to find out if people actually do, though. Yeah, uh, the stats of it. Any last words on Stellaris Dev Diary 163 before we wrap it up with Hoi 4? I what? would say one one last thing is the big thing about having these big ships, you can you can add a role play element because you've got one big flagship where you can like project a certain characteristic onto it. Like, yeah. you know, if it you know, if it's got lots of you know, lasers or something, you can you can role play a lot more right. with one big ship than you can with like an army, you know what I mean? See, I I, so I used to do that with battleships, but poor battleships now, they've been so, you know, one up but like the titans came out and they're like oh battleships are just cannon fodder now and now we've got juggernauts where it's like oh yeah titans yeah, it's like that's every cute. every expansion is gonna have like yeah. an even bigger ship <laughs> eventually have, like, we'll just have yeah a galaxy sized you know black <laughs> hole cruiser or something that's it yeah death stars next obviously i think well the thing at least with the juggernauts is it is limited to one for your entire empire True. Yeah. Titans, you can slowly build more depending on the size of your empire. It does cap out though. Yeah. Usually at one, two, or three. It, right. For the size of empires I do. Well, mm -hmm. battleships are unlimited. <laughs> yeah, it's true. All I'm right. Cool. So I, just earlier today. Oh, did you have anything you know something else to add? No, we, I, this this isn't really about the dev diary. We can go back to a, another point. A, okay. Another controversial opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm full of them. Uh, yeah, let's talk about Hoy. what. Lambert, is it about the fact that there's Wasid in Stellaris? No. 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 Oh, because okay. there's there's no map modes that Wasid gets rid of. Um, that that's that's. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> God damn. I still oh. I I use WASD to move the map, and I still manually click on all the map modes. I still. After I, thousands I of too. hours, I still don't use hotkeys for my map modes. I'm far Ditto. too lazy to use like two hands when I'm playing video games. I just like <laughs> edge scroll on with using my mouse. Oh yeah, <laughs> you're just like sort of leaning back. Lounge allowed like sort of hedonism bot from Futurama. Yeah, <laughs> you've got like a goblet of wine in one hand the whole time you're playing. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> See, that, that's funny um, that you mentioned edge scrolling because that's one of my favorite changes in the new Libby patch for Imperator. Because you can now turn off edge scrolling, and I love that. <laughs> I oh, hate yeah. edge scrolling so There much. you go. <laughs> oh. Anyway, Hoy. Let's talk about Hoy. Yeah, Hearts of Iron. Uh, hey. Yeah, so we got a new dev diary just today uh, that's about the new Intel system. I'll say my concern with Intel in general is, like, I feel like, especially if you're playing single player, I'm not sure how often... Like, this is actually going to matter to me because Hoi 4 is generally a game of just, like, building more stuff than the other person and, like, knowing which stuff is going to be their stuff. Um, I do I do think they made it, like, a point that, oh, I hadn't thought of that before about, like, knowing where someone's civilian industry is concentrated might help you decide where you want to, like, foment resistance if you're you're doing, like, one of the new operations where you can like raise resistance in a state mm -hmm. um yeah what did you guys think about i guess just the idea of intel and hearts of iron in general and kind of the changes that are are coming to it in uh well, i was thinking it expansion. from a multiplayer point of view yeah and i'm thinking most people if you know playing on a faction they're going to pick one person on that faction to focus on gathering intel mm -hmm. yeah building yeah, the side planes and sending everything. And then everyone else is probably going to maybe not fully ignore it, but just not prioritize it. Yeah. Well, I think there's like one one person has is in uh, like the spy master, right? Right. So every faction yep. has the one one spy master. I will say, yeah. as someone who doesn't play a whole lot of Hearts of Iron, I'm kind of it for more of a um, someone who's in, interested in history aspect of it. And from that angle, the addition of Intel is fantastic because intel is kind of important and kind of one of the huge reasons why we won the war so mm. having intel true. in the game is i mean the fact that it wasn't there before in any meaningful capacity is a bit of a crime so seeing it in now is is great what was it the there was that one event where they planted a dead body yes. and made it look like he'd been yeah. a 
an intelligence officer or something. Yeah, and yeah. So he had a lot of info on him to trick the Germans. Yeah, and the yeah, Spanish like, picture. Like a false... That's it. Mm-hmm. They, like, washed up in the Mediterranean, right? But it was just like... A... Yeah, just off the coast of Spain, yeah. And the Spanish gave it to the Germans, and they were like, oh, so they're going to put their main thrust in uh, in Sicily, eh? Well, we'll just take troops out of Normandy to facilitate that. So. There, mm-hmm. there we go. Operation Mincemeat. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's like a really That's grotesque right. name. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also the, 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 fake, the fake army we created to fool the Germans, which you'll be able to do now. Uh, yeah yeah which that that seems, that seems really interesting. especially for multiplayer i i'm i'm gonna love using that yeah um well, yeah being able to organize was... the resistance movements in other countries as well is great yeah. i mean the the french resistance was not especially well organized and frequently fought other french resistance movements and then <laughs> the british <laughs> that's very french a lot of, uh, our own officers to make it organized and without that happening, without the organization there, uh, I mean, we we destroyed a lot of, or as, as we, the French resistance uh, destroyed a lot of the railroads uh, going to Normandy to prevent a lot of reinforcements going there. And, you know, so that, it, it works that kind of angle as well. So, yeah, from a historical point of view, uh, it's it's a great addition. Yeah, well, definitely. even um, it was the ba- the Midway movie that just came out about a month ago or so, which reminded me of and got me talking with some people. But like even the Battle of Midway, they had deter they were trying to determine if it was Midway or somewhere else that the Japanese were going to attack. And so they deliberately set out a code that they knew the Japanese could break. And basically said Midway is short on food, and so later they got, they got coded messages from the Japanese that they were that they had code you know they could break, that said oh the target is low on food. Ah, I so see, they, I mm. see. Yeah, so I've, doing that they were able to figure out who where was being attacked. I mean this this uh, and you know this this will actually change a lot of uh, the Pacific conflict, right? Because I think you can change. You can see where the enemies have deployed their fleets in a similar way like that now, right? That is mm-hmm. cool. That's going to be pretty big. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I love all the the cool like spy stuff and commando stuff that's coming in this expansion. The new resistance, the new occupation stuff. I just worry that the actual intel collection part of it in single player. I'm mostly going to be concerned about this. I'm mostly going to be pretty concerned with this 10.9 percent intel advantage in battle, and that the time scale of Hoi 4 might not allow me to like pause and like look at, okay, what kind of templates is my, are my enemies using? And then mm-hmm. I don't know, unless you have like the, the uh, flexible production um, tech, it's not really going to make sense to like redo your tanks to counter that. I don't know. Maybe a little, end, that'll end up being a bigger deal than I feel like it's going to be. But uh let I us know. Just, I Let us know on the content stuff. Point. Yeah. It feels hmm. like it'll definitely be more of a bigger deal, at least for the democracies that wait longer to get into the war. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially yeah. Britain. Like when when Britain's fighting alone, you can't really do much when you're defending your islands. You could do a bit of North Africa, you know, a bit of India and Burma and stuff, but mainland Germany, you're basically waiting on the Americans to come over. So in the meantime, you can you can use Intel to sow the seeds for D-Day. Or maybe, like, see where the civilian factories are and go full Bomber mm-hmm. Harris onto, like, if, the, the proper Or even there's areas. the coups. Um, a yeah, yeah. diary a few days ago, was, or a few weeks ago, was about the coups, which I thought was interesting. Especially their comment about it may be worth your while to start a coup that you know is going to fail just to cause issues. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's, that, mm-hmm. that's smart, yeah. Yeah, that stuff's gonna be really fun to play with. I'm I'm really looking forward to when somebody takes that and like the port border conflict slash gain support stuff that was added for China in Waking the Tiger and makes like a legitimately good like Cold War mod. Because mm-hmm. I think we're getting to the point where you really could. Like the mechanics oh, are yeah. there. Um the Cold War gone hot. Sort of like uh Yeah, right. <laughs> well, but it's that that really good mod that looks like it's coming out. So it's like um Oh, was it New World Order? Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. That's based on the cold. That looks fantastic. Very dystopic. 
grim. <laughs> yeah, actually, he, I think I'm pretty sure that the, they're they're following us on Twitter, and we would like to have them on at some point to uh, talk about their mod, which is one of the many things we're going to be doing. Yeah, it's, it's probably um, the one I'm most looking forward to. The hard, hard for mod. Apart from the, the fabled China update. <laughs> for, for guys, all right. <laughs> right. Um, so we've got a little longer than an hour on this. I think it's okay since it's it's kind of the pilot, but I don't want to go too much longer than an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get out of here, though, uh, if if you guys in chat have any questions about us or the show or our experiences, I think uh, you guys okay to stick around for maybe like 15 more minutes to take some yeah. questions? I'm good. Yeah, no problem. All right. Uh, so chat, now is the time. Uh, if you'd like to ask us anything before time. we get out of here, we'll probably include a little little bit on the end here. Uh, for those of you that are of watching us live, yeah. right? <laughs> That's true, kind yeah. enough to join <laughs> us for this initial uh, <laughs> broadcast. We had we had a, a hundred and fifty people tune in at some point during this first episode, which oh, is pretty fantastic. awesome. Yeah. That's so yeah. Awesome. Cool. I will say because um, I, I did say I was going to go back to it, but then never saw an opportunity. But do you want to talk about mods while we're waiting for some questions to come in? Sure. Um, so you're you're talking about mods for Civ and mods for CK2, but like we've got to talk about Mayo and Taxes a little bit, surely. Because that's kind of I did oh, yeah. see someone like, mention that in chat. Well, I still it's have go. I still have not played it because I played a very early build that killed my computer. <laughs> and I yeah, not same. literally, but I've heard they've gotten better and I do need to go back to it. Um I'm so, I'm mostly um, waiting for 3.0 now, which looks so damn good. But um, there's so many things in Mayo and Texas that I want EU4 to just, oh, that's yeah. a good idea. I'll have that. I, I just want yeah. just hire Jigo, please, because please. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I found that's, that's the case with more than just strategy games, too, because like Fallout New Vegas, very good game. Fallout New Vegas with the Project Nevada mod, I think, is probably about as close to a 10 out of 10 as any RPG I've played. And I think it's because modders will do things that like a game development studio would never do oh, yeah, because they, they'd they can definitely take be more worried about alienating a part of their audience or whatever. But uh, we do yeah. have a few questions. Yeah. Oh, so okay. oh, first one, Lexi Lambert and I will talk about that in our own discords. <laughs> the next PVP stream. <laughs> dream. You guys. Hey, you guys are welcome to shill for your own stuff while uh, while you're on this show. Well, we have to figure uh, out what we're doing. <laughs> okay. So go check out their discords. I'll put a link in the description uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or the show notes if you're watching or listening to it on another platform. Uh, Alfred Strike, our uh, our good friend, says, will you be planning on doing this at a similar time each week? That's the plan. Yep. Um, I don't know if all four of us will make it every single week, but we'll probably have some guests rotating in. Oh, I don't have a life. Don't worry. I'll be, I'll be oh, here. Yeah. I, I <laughs> will the be able to be here, I think, every week until May. There'll probably be several weeks I won't be able to join in with you guys. So uh, <laughs> there. next week is the 18th. I don't see any reason. Personally, I wouldn't be able to be here. But then the Wednesday after that is Christmas Day and New Year's Day. I have family in town, so there might not be a show those weeks. I don't um, think many people are expecting us to do no. a podcast on Christmas <laughs> no. Day. Okay. No. Uh, it's a Christmas special. That's what it is. But yeah, so so probably the 18th and then the 8th of January will be the next uh, the next two episodes. Yeah. Um, Just uh, follow us. Let me put drop in our Twitter link for you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So Valor Gain wants to know the game that Paradox should make that they aren't making as far as we know that's not Vicky 3. <laughs> My quick answer to that would be I'd love to see a fantasy grand strategy game along the lines of Crusader Kings. Um, Same. I or something should... set in late antiquity like between Imperator and CK. Well they need something yeah, so I... they can have a, a, a mega campaign that doesn't have right. any gaps. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I badger people about this all the time but Paradox should buy the rights to fall from heaven and make Fall from Heaven into a Paradox Grand Strategy game. That's what I think. It, it can, I, I would love to see that. If we can expand it uh, from Paradox uh, created to Paradox published, what would you like uh-huh. to see them publish? What what studio would you like to see them bring under their wing? Like maybe because oh. I've got one. Um, okay, Age of Mythology with Age of Empires four coming out soon. 
I want to see Age of Mythology back as well because I kind of preferred that to Age of Empires too, and that's a more heresy. Age of Mythology. Oh, I want to see oh, that. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe if Paradox could, you know, do something with that. Maybe <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> something with hmm. do a real time strategy that? sort of game. I mean, yeah, we already have are technically yeah. possible real time. A, a mythology kind of grand strategy game would be awesome with dwarves mm-hmm. and sphinxes and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, I want to see that. Yeah, yeah. Alfred yeah. thinks that uh, the game, the secret game Wiz is working on right now is a World of Darkness grand strategy game, which would be cool. Yeah, it would. Um, I would definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to make a dark fantasy mod for CK3, but I don't want to confirm anything yet because <laughs> I need to, I need to understand the scope of what I'd be getting into. But I have plans. <laughs> um, Interesting. I, I want to be able to be a vampire in CK3. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, definitely try that if you want to play as a vampire. Uh, Rose, what game do you places. think other than Vicky 3 that they, they should be making? Mm. I mean, if a year ago I would have said CK3. So All right. I'm pretty much getting my dream at the moment. Um, yeah. But I would kind of be interested in sort of like a Korea, China, Japan sort of level of CK. Like, sort of, you know, Crusader Kings, but it obviously couldn't be called Crusader Kings because it's not about crusading. Mm-hmm. But something like that. I um, I don't know anyone here who might have played Sengoku. Sendo, Sengo, yes. I can't yeah, say the word. I really love Sengoku. Sengoku. Yeah, I've it's still never fun. played Sengoku. Sengoku. It's really yeah. good. It's, it's interesting, especially if you've played original Crusader Kings and then Crusader Kings 2, because you can kind of see them going towards Crusader Kings 2. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. But something like that, but that also was a bigger in scope, larger in scope, that encompassed China and uh, Korea and a lot of the other areas there that were, you know, all working together. They all had trade routes together. They all knew of each other. Right. I, I'm, and if they did that, it would be a huge financial success, too. Because you look at, like, Free mm-hmm. Kingdoms to a war. Oh, yeah. The, the sales on oh, that yeah. were just, like, off the charts. It was incredible. Definitely. Yes. There's a lot of Chinese people. And they, like, is, yeah. they, they, they yes. do like, China like video games. games about China. Yeah, yeah. I and just did there... a, uh, I just did an update um, on the best mods for Three Kingdoms, which you can find on PC Gamer, and a lot of like the Chinese mod scene has really embraced that game, which I thought was cool. That's uh, awesome. Like a lot of the top mods, like the description is all in Chinese because they they have their specific idea well, of what three kingdoms is supposed to look like. And uh, well, what I find yeah. interesting um, is if I go in through and I look at users that have followed me on Twitch, there's mm-hmm. quite a few people with their names in Hangul, which is the oh, really? Korean written yeah. language. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Well, I think like um, there's, there's, there's large markets. We don't get to see it because it's obviously the language barrier, but like even stuff like Hearts of Iron, which is, which is banned in China. It's got a huge following in China. Like, there's, there's huge forums <laughs> dedicated to Hearts of Iron that are bigger than the Paradox forums. Or so I've been told, anyway. I can't verify that. That might just be here, say. But. I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Hmm. Um, and if, that, if that's the sort of following you can get with a game that was banned, <laughs> imagine. <laughs> right. Imagine, you know. It's a um, game that wasn't banned. Exactly, yeah. So we've got, I'll t- we'll take one more question. This is from Five Strip. Um, they say it took me 20 hours to really understand CK2. How difficult was it for you to learn your first GSG? I was still discovering basic mechanics in CK2, like 150 hours in. Mm-hmm. But the great thing about CK2 is you don't need to understand how all yeah, you or don't. even most of yeah. the mechanics work to have a good time. That's right. You don't. Yeah, yeah. It, you can literally just unpause the game and get pop ups as long as you know how to marry someone. See, you're yeah. good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, I learned the game by watching Northern Line, which, looking back at it now, probably wasn't the best strategy. <laughs> um, but basically what I had on was on one of my screens, I would have his um, his videos, and then on the other screen, I would have the game, and I would copy what he was doing, yeah. and then hmm. seeing what the results were, and like and having a look around in the in the UI and seeing all the different things while watching at the same time and especially copying what he was doing being the same person marrying the same people if possible that really sped up my learning process into getting into ck2 
The, I did something similar, but I was not as nearly as organized. Literally, I would just play the videos on like my iPad uh -huh. while I was playing the game and starting with like quills. Yeah. And then literally just do my own thing and just sort of get ideas for how you could move around um, troop management mm. because I had not played a grand strategy game before. Yeah, I, I'm just um, a big advocate of like jumping in and failing at the game, but like sort mm -hmm. of oh, yeah. running oh. through failing like big time. Like, <laughs> my first, my first Crusader Kings game, I was like, oh, I can declare war on the people because you basically had a no CB in the original Crusader Kings. I was over mm -hmm. in Ireland. What I didn't notice because so new is I didn't realize that doing these no CBs made everyone angry at me. Oh <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Until basically the whole thing just imploded. Yeah, and I did. I did exactly generation. the same thing in E3 when I first played it. I played Island, and I was like, "Oh, I could just declare war on all these other people, like coming from Civ." And I just like, and I just ruined my country completely. Like, <laughs> and then England yeah. came along and just stomped me so bad. I'm pretty sure everyone has fun stories of really large fun. coalition wars. Well, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Ro, Ro and Kaiser from Three Moves Ahead and I are always talking about how CK2 is more fun when it's just an absolute disaster. Oh, yeah. Like mm -hmm. when, when it just gets completely out of control and you're trying to it's save fine. your house from ruin is so much better than when you have like an empire with like six under Kings and just nobody can stop you and everybody loves mm -hmm. you. And at that point it's just like, well, I could I keep playing till 1453 and see how much of the map I could turn my color or, you know, I could just start a new game and be a, a scrappy count again. I think that's part of the charm right now of the Bronzeman challenges. Yeah. Anyone that's been watching me this week can see how easily everything falls apart because someone gets sick or bopped on the head. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of them you have to keep like a specific character alive to complete I've, the yes. objectives. I'm yeah. having terrible luck with that with the whales challenge. I just I just want to get that, that glittering streaming hair. They got me. They, <laughs> they got me on the hook for it. Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. shout out to Quill, definitely, because I remember I'd been playing CK2 and EU4 previously, and then I tried to boot up Victoria 2, and I was like, oh man, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and I think I, I literally just searched like Victoria 2 tutorial or something on YouTube, because yeah. I usually learn what better by watching someone yeah. do it than by reading a guide, mm -hmm. and yeah, Quill was the first thing that came up, so he... He, uh, he taught me to play Victoria 2. For, uh, for Victoria 2, I've got to give a shout out to Shenra, um, his yeah. Japan campaign. Yeah. I can't remember who yeah, taught yeah. me EU4, honestly. Uh, I remember incredibly well what I got for CK2 and Vicky2, but I guess because, you know, 5,000 hours of EU4, everything kind of blurs together. Yeah. I've got to say, probably like 2,000 hours of that is Mayo and Taxes, because that mod is just phenomenal. Yeah, but to, watching Quill taught me CK2, watching Roomba taught me EU4, and for Hoy, I had chat teaching me. <laughs> oh yeah, it was most likely a Roomba teaching me EU4 as well. But, a, Roomba, uh, a Roomba teaching me EU4 is dropping you pretty pretty quickly into the deep end. That's uh, that's some advanced stuff. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah well, his, his 112 of... episode tutorial series with Filthy Robot, <laughs> that, mm, memories. Yeah. I was, I was I a real ran out of uh, when I was CK2 learning. videos, and so I watched was... EU4 videos while playing CK2. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, I just decided I was going to try and learn myself, and I ended up just <laughs> playing the game very, very badly for maybe like a hundred hours. Yeah, I definitely recommend like all the other tutorial videos right now because like I don't think I would know how Hearts of Iron's naval system works. I still yeah, know works. Heart, if it Hearts of Iron. For, like, if you Hearts watch of Iron is probably the... the hardest one to jump into with no knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, if you watch the Hoi 4 um, big war that we had at PDXCon, Mordred Viking really showed his knowledge of the naval system. <laughs> Just what spamming submarines <laughs> yeah. or something. I remember, um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, do, I don't know, but he might be planning to do a tutorial series if we oh, nice. get him on here to talk about it. Yeah, I have one that I released during 1.0 that's like completely obsolete at this point that <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I should probably redo that someday. And people are like, hey, when are you redoing War College? And I'm like, I don't know. It's maybe at some point. That's a really good name. <laughs> yeah. Um, good, yeah. On, on the topic of yeah. tutorials, I am planning on making an Imperator tutorial. But I was like, okay, I'm going to do it after this patch comes out. And then the game completely changed. 
and then oh there's another patch coming out. Oh, I'll do it after that patch, but January I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> finally get get my teeth into making that tutorial. Nice. Um, well, that's actually uh, how I was planning to end the show is everybody just plug your stuff. Uh, talk about, you know, where, where people can find your work other than right here on this podcast. Uh, Loris, you want to start? Um, oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> Do I inflict that upon people? I mean, like, <laughs> um, it's, it's chapelcomic.com if you want to see some... some uh, Dropping the link comics. for you. There <laughs> yeah. we go. And there this will all be this will all be in the description slash show notes if you're watching this after the fact. Uh, Rose, where can people find your stuff? Uh, primarily on Twitch. I stream five to six days a week here at Enigmatic Rose Four. All right. Um, I also put some stuff on YouTube though that is secondary. I do tutorial videos over there for CK Two. Cool, cool. Lambert. Um, mostly on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash Lambert2191. Um, I got a lot of multiplayer campaigns going that I cut, uh, that I stream over on DLive. Uh, Lambert2191 there as well. And I cut them up and I put them on YouTube as well as some dedicated campaigns there as well. At the moment, I'm going for a lot of achievements as Rome in uh, Imperator Rome. So yeah, if you want to check that out, then that's cool. I also do dev diary videos for CK3 and Imperator every week, uh, just giving my thoughts and feedback on the various things. So, yeah, that's me. Fantastic. And the best place to follow me is usually on my Twitter, if you can put up with it, uh, which is <laughs> Asa TJ. That's A-S-A-T-J, uh, Alpha Sierra, Alpha Tango Juliet for our Hearts of Iron uh, friends in the audience. Um, I do some stuff on Twitch and YouTube off and on occasionally. It's been a while. Lorsworn Gaming is the channel name. I am planning a new Imperator series uh, sometime in the near future. You can also find me under the same name on Reddit and on the Three Moves Ahead podcast, which is uh, in a way kind of a parent podcast to this one. It's more general strategy games. We talk about all the latest releases. We don't go super in-depth on um paradox dev diaries but uh that's what this show's for Mm -hmm. um any any final thoughts before we we wrap up this uh pilot episode we're all on twitter too yeah (laughs) we are all on twitter yeah Yeah. (laughs) we'll we'll have we'll have everybody's links to the to the hell site in the description as well (laughs) yeah and if you're watching this somewhere else and want to tune in live we use no cb cast on twitch Oh yep, no CB cast, Twitch, Twitter, uh, SoundCloud. Um, that will eventually be our YouTube URL once we pass whatever thresholds that we need to actually set a custom URL. But for now, just the link, the long weird non affiliate link will be in the description. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. Alfrey has a question. Uh, have a Patreon link. Uh, stay tuned on that. Um, I I I. I have some uh, preliminary plans on how we're going to monetize this show. Uh, and probably in the new year will be the time to uh, listen for news on that. And I think that's going to do it. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks for everybody who is watching this on YouTube later or listening. Hopefully it should be up on uh, like Stitcher and iTunes and all that stuff. The Thursday after each episode, which is going to be live on every Wednesday. Uh, but I do know that those like podcast aggregator sites have like an application process. So I'm not sure how long it'll take us to be listed on there, but you can find us on soundcloud.com slash no CB cast until then. Uh, and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Tra. Thanks for watching. Bye guys. Bye-bye.